started. Okay, welcome everyone to today's Biz Chat featuring West Hills College Lemoore's nursing program. We have two guest speakers today who will be talking about this program with us. Uh, Rupinder and Kathy, if you would please just introduce yourselves. Kathy, if you would go first and then Rupinder. Sure. Hi everyone, welcome. It's good to see all the faces. Uh, my name is Catherine DeFady. I'm the Director of Health Careers and the Director of Nursing for uh, West Hills College Lamore. Thank you. Rupinder. Hi, everyone. This is Rupinder. I am a counselor here at West Hills College Lamore, and I um, counsel students who are interested in the nursing program and other health careers. Perfect. Thank you, guys. So we'll go ahead and get started with our first question. Um, please just describe to us the nursing program at West Hills College Lamar. Okay. Well, our program is a two-year, four-semester program uh, that prepares students to be able to sit for the NCLEX at the end of graduation and successful completion. Um, we have a couple different options, and I think you might know, depending on where you are in terms of your exploration in nursing programs. There are associate degree nursing programs and bachelor degree nursing programs, which are traditionally in four-year schools. One of the options that we offer though with our two-year associate degree nursing program is a concurrent enrollment program. So we have agreements with two four-year universities where students will enroll in um, bachelor level courses while they're in the program with us. So when they graduate from our program, they will have less than a year to complete their bachelor's in nursing. So it's a really um, great opportunity to get an inexpensive op way to start towards your bachelor's degree while you're in our associate degree program. Um, we have about probably 40% of our students or a little bit more than that that actually participate in that particular option. And it's quite successful. We admit 30 traditional students, which means these are traditional RN students that have taken prerequisites and come in um, and go through the entire nursing program. And then we admit 10 LVN to RN uh, nursing students every year. So we only admit once a year, 40 students. So that's not a lot when you think about the need and the area and the demand um, and how many students are looking for spots in nursing programs. Our curriculum for the nursing program currently consists of a culture of health curriculum. This is the new curriculum that we've designed that's rolled out this fall. Um, and it's a very um, kind of a futuristic in a way um, for associate level programs um, curriculum that we actually place students for clinical in the hospital setting, but we also have a considerable amount of time in the community setting for clinical as well. So students are preparing themselves for a multitude of roles within nursing, not just those in the hospital, because there are so many other careers outside of the hospital um, that are tending to grow and progress as, as our healthcare is moving more into the community and towards a uh, prevention and wellness approach to healthcare. Um, so as I mentioned, we do have a significant shortage in nursing, especially in the Central Valley. We have the least amount of nurses um, available um, to treat the number of patients that we have in our area. We have more shortages than they do in LA area and in the Bay area. 100% uh, of our students who graduate get employed. Um, mm -hmm. Probably almost 100% of them are, are offered jobs prior to graduation. Um, so we don't have any issues with that. Um, we get probably 300 to 400 applications per year for those 40 spots. This year we received 500. That is the most we've ever received. Um, so as you can see, the process to get into a nursing program is very competitive. Many of the programs are impacted just like ours. Um, all of the programs get way more applicants and qualified applicants, I will say, than they can actually admit. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And that would take a whole nother um, conversation, but it's a faculty, you know, recruitment issue. It's this, you know, uh, clinical placement issue. Uh, there's only so much we can do um, in trying to get these students through. Um, so when you're preparing for a nursing program, you, you wanna start preparing way in advance. This isn't something you decide to do on a whim. You have to 
really look at your courses. You have to look at your prerequisites. You want your GPA to be as strong as possible. Um, but us, as well as most community college uh, programs admit under a, um, a chancellor's office multi-criteria or point-based system. So students receive points for their application in various areas of this criteria. Um, some schools, we have differences. So for example, COS has some differences in their criteria versus us. So sometimes a student might be more competitive at COS than they are at our program and vice versa. Um, but there are some things that are very similar because there are some criteria that we have to have in there that is mandated by the chancellor's office, but then we have some variations. Um, so, but most of us in the community college setting admit based on this point-based system. Anybody uh, in the CSUs, they're gonna look at your T-score and your GPA. Those two things are pretty much all they look at in terms of that. So for us, for our program, work experience has some heavy weight to it as well as GPA, um, but having some experience in healthcare before you come into a nursing program is very helpful because it just gives you an idea of what you're getting into. Um, you're working hard, it's a tough program. You wanna make sure it is what you want to do and that you want to stick with it. Um, and so getting some healthcare experience prior to coming in gives you points as well as just helps you with that whole transition and moving into healthcare. So I think that's all I have to say on that question. Thank you, <laughs> perfect. So then our second question for you is, what does this program provide to students? So, um, you know, I, I'm, of course, biased about being a nurse because I am a nurse. I've been a nurse for 35 years. Um, I was a CNA early on, probably 16 years old, something like that, volunteered and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I have never been unemployed. I have never been bored. Um, I have done a multitude of different things from, I started out in pediatrics as a bedside nurse, <clears throat> excuse me. I've gone into management, I've gone into education. Um, I've done a variety of, of things and you can never um, be dissatisfied. There's just so much versatility. Every time you add an additional degree to a nursing license, it opens up a wide variety of doors and, and opportunities. It's just, there's just nothing more satisfying than being able to um, adjust your work and your, and your career around your family. As your family changes, you can make decisions about how you wanna work. Um, you can support yourself financially on a nurse's salary. Um, and this is with a two-year education. This is with an associate degree. You can still come out after two years of education and an RN licensure and be able to support a family. So there's just no other way to go other than up as you add those, those degrees and that um, experience to your resume. Thank you. So then our next question is, how can a student prepare to apply for the nursing program? Um, basically, they can apply several ways. The, the main thing is taking the correct classes. So because of the fact that it is a program that you're applying to, you have to have the right particular courses. Each program does have a little bit of differences, but the majority of them are gonna ask for human anatomy, human physiology, microbiology, um, and English 1A, a communications course like COM1, um, a general psychology and introduction to sociology. Now, some, certain schools might have different requirements. That's why I do recommend that every student make a list. You make a list of the approved programs you wanna to apply to. One great website is the Board of Nursing website, which is www.rn.ca.gov. In that Board of Nursing website, you can actually look at the NCLEX pass rates. So especially if you're considering private schools or BSN, ADN, so forth, it'll give you a list of all the approved programs in California and the pass rates. So it's a good way to kind of go through um, and then make that list. And I tell students, make the list, basically go forward and then go backwards. You know, make a list of where you want to apply to, see how they select to make sure that you're meeting that. Like um, Ms. Defiti had mentioned earlier, a lot of times, you know, we do, um, every nursing program is impacted and the way they select is different as well. And you can be more competitive for one school 
versus another. So it's important to do well academically. So one of the biggest things is taking the right courses and taking the right sequence. I've had students take physiology before anatomy and you don't wanna do that. You wanna take anatomy before you take physio because anatomy is the parts and physio is the function of the parts. Um, in our class, for example, at West Hills, microbiology is prereq of chemistry. But if you went to COS, COS's uh, microbiology doesn't have a prereq of chem. But if you applied to our program, you would need chemistry. So it's just little things that you want to make sure. So you definitely want to make sure that you are applying, taking the correct courses and doing well academically. Uh, one of the biggest things you don't want to do is repeat. You don't want to repeat your uh, prereqs of anatomy, phys, micro, and English. Um, because repeats can affect the point system. Um, so once you take it, you know, do well, balance your load. Um, I always say if you're going to take four classes, too easy, too hard. Um, the other thing, if you're taking one unit, three hours that you should, you know, uh, prepare for it. So three unit class could be nine hours a week, but it could even be a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I do have that you wanted to also mention transfer website that's available yes. for students. Yes, sorry. So the, uh, the other website is assist.org. So www.assist.org. Um, that is, especially if you're considering applying to BSN programs, um, coming from a community college, you can do all the courses needed um, to apply and then transfer. And that's a good way to see which classes are equivalent to see if our chemistry is equivalent to the one Fresno State needs and so forth. So it's a good way to research that as well. Sounds good. Thank you. So then my next question is, what qualifications does a student need to get into this program? So at West Hills, we, um, like um, previously mentioned, we are a point-based system. So the minimum to apply, you have to have the minimum four prereqs of anatomy, physiology, micro, and English, and a minimum 2.5 in those four classes, which is basically if you got all Cs, then you wouldn't meet the minimum. Um, you would um, need then a minimum cumulative GPA of 2.5. So all the college classes you've attended, all the community colleges and so forth do follow you. So it's important that you do well academically. Now, meeting the minimum doesn't necessarily mean you're competitive. Um, you know, in the past, we've had over 400 applications and um, the total points possible is 100. Um, and we use that point-based system. So 50% of the points is coming from your GPA, 35 just from anatomy, phys, micro and English. So shooting for those, you know, at least a three, five kind of being competitive, no C's, if you can avoid the C's, that would be great, um, you know, and offsetting that. But then looking at the other sides of the points, we do have 50 points that is non-GPA related that go towards work experience, having a degree and so forth. And all of that is also available on our website as well. Thank you. And then what are some of the biggest day-to-day -day challenges students face in this program? Um, I would say, you know, our students, uh, you know, of course, these last, this last year has been incredibly challenging, you know, with COVID, um, you know, last March we were removed from clinical sites, everything was closed. Um, so there was some delays getting students back in, which stresses everybody out and, you know, they have families and kids on zoom and, um, all sorts of things going on. I would say one of the biggest challenges is, is the time management. You know, these programs are very, very time consuming. So even though you might be in class Tuesdays and Thursdays all day for theory, you're also going to be in clinical at least one or two days a week. And we do 12 hour shifts for those. And then you have, of course, study time, preparation for class, um, and then your own family life. So that is probably the biggest stressor is just managing the program around your entire life. Um, so often before students come in, that's something that we kind of talk to them about is how can you best position yourself to have the most support that you need to be able to get through the program um, because a lot of things probably aren't going to get done as normally they would if you weren't in school in an intensive program, um, remembering it's for a very short period of time. And, you know, it's important that you have a rigorous program because, you know, this is a life or death education. Yeah. You know, it's kind of crazy when you think about it, that you can have an associate's degree, a two-year degree, and you could actually potentially really harm somebody. You know, it's kind of crazy when you think about that. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, you know, we're, we take our jobs very seriously and we really ensure that the students are educated and competent. So, you know, there's some high stakes testing, which creates additional pressure, um, learning study strategies to be able to uh, do well in the courses. Um, those are pretty much the, the stressors. Also, a lot of students work, you know, even though they're in school, a lot of them either have to work or they choose to work or they're in externships. Um, because all of those experiences, whether you're working in healthcare or you get an externship, you know, that's a foot in the door. So you can find out those places you want to work. So when you graduate, you kind of have a turnkey opportunity to step into a position. So, um, but, you know, those are probably the biggest challenges, just pretty much time management and, and fitting everything in with all the family and hectic life of, of a nursing student. That's good. Thank you. Uh, what career opportunities are available for students after this program? Well, of course, there's there's many. I mean, we could go on for, for days and there's new roles being developed all the time. Um, primarily, new graduates will go directly into the hospital setting, which is just fine. It's perfectly appropriate, whether it's uh, some will maybe go to Valley Children's and specialize in pediatrics. Um, some will choose obstetrics in, at St. Agnes or community. Um, our students do clinical at all the facilities in Fresno as well as Adventist systems. Um, so, you know, those med surge experiences at least for the first year are very important. So that's very helpful to kind of get your really good baseline competency. So that's where every new nurse will start and often on the night shift, we've all done it. I worked two years of nights in pediatrics as a brand new nurse. And, you know, I mean, those are some of my fondest memories, actually. Those were the good old days, I like to call them. <laughs> Things have changed a lot since 1988, you know. Um, so uh, those, you know, and I miss the kids, I miss patient care, that kind of thing. But then you go on and somebody sees something in you or somebody says, hey, I think you should do this or that. And you go and get that another degree and then they pull you in to do something else. And then next thing you know, you're doing these different kinds of things that you really never thought that you would. You know, I really thought I'd graduate and I was gonna be at the bedside and that's really all I wanted to do was take care of patients. I had no idea there was this other opportunity of educating students later on, you know, and how valuable that is to actually turn around and share your knowledge and watch these folks grow into really good, strong nurses. So there's a lot of different opportunity management, um, which can be stressful, but it's also very rewarding to, to see how you can build teams and people can work well together and do great things. So there's just, there's just so much. There's community health, there's public health nursing, there's clinic work, hospice, uh, home health. Um, so what we're trying to do in this program is expose students to all of those roles so they can see all of the opportunities available. Uh, school nursing is another thing that's very um, valuable as well. So there's just so much available um, that it's just endless. So every time I run into maybe a, a nurse at the bedside who might be, you know, difficult to work with or seems to be unhappy, you know, there's really no reason for that. You just need to find where that place is for you that's happy because um, there's just too much opportunity to be in a job that you don't like. Um, one question from what you were referencing just a few minutes ago, you mentioned the two years, most likely night shifts would be, you know, the typical standard. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, do you, is the experience that people then get to change your schedule to a regular eight to five or what's, oh, yes. what's your experience from there? Well, you know, if you're, if you're brand new nurse, traditionally, most of the time you might go to the night shift, 12 hour nights. You know, it is kind of, it's kind of difficult, but when you're working 12 hours, you know, you're only working three days a week, you know, so you're there eight hours. So you're there a little extra four hours, but you've got like this long stretch of days off. Um, so it really creates a, a great lifestyle really um, in any situation. And there's a lot of nurses that prefer to work night shift because their kids go to school during the day. So they sleep while their kids are at school. And then that way they're available for them for them later, you know, it's just, you know, it just works kind of differently for everyone. But I was on nights for two years, but then I went to my supervisor and just said, hey, when there's a day spot open, I'm ready to go. Because day shift is really busy and you have to kind of have a lot of experience under your belt to manage all of what gets thrown at you. You've got all the physicians out there demanding things. You've got families out there. Um, night shift, you're kind of by yourself in a lot of ways. You have to make a lot of decisions. You have to 
um, collaborate with different people. You might have pharmacy available, maybe they're not. And so you learn a lot of things and become pretty self-sufficient to think for yourself and a good critical thinker. So when you take that to day shift, you're really well prepared for that. Um, but yeah, that will happen. Then you go to days and, um, and then various jobs within the hospital will have different hours depending on what those roles are. Usually if you're at the bedside, it's 12 hours. If you go to case management, that's gonna be more of an eight hour. Or if you become an educator in the hospital where you're educating the staff, that's usually eight hours. So, you know, you can make those decisions based on your family needs. So I didn't even go into teaching until my kids were pretty small. And that's when I started teaching at Fresno State in the nursing program, because that was something that worked well for me and their schedules. I was off when they were off. You know, I could pick them up from school. You know, those are just kind of things that are important to you in your life balance and work. Um, so when you have, if I didn't have though that master's degree at that point, I couldn't have taught there. So having that degree made it, you know, uh, possible for me to take that position at Fresno State. I taught there for 25 years. Sounds good, thank you. So we have one more question and then we can open the floor up for questions from many of the audience members. Um, if you do have a question, uh, feel free to post it in the chat and I'll um, go through those one by one. Um, after this last question is asked. So uh, what advice would you give to students who are looking to succeed in this program? My advice, and Rapinder, you can follow up please too if I miss something. My advice would be to um, be focused on the fact that, you know, this isn't forever, you know, cause it is, you know, we've all been through nursing programs. You know, we've all done it. There are tears, there's frustration, there's anxiety there's stress, it is high pressure. Um, you know, we expect you to come to clinical prepared. We want you to know that you know what's going on with this patient, you know, because it's, it's important. If you make a mistake, it could be their life. It could be, you know, your license. It could be, you know, a lot of different things. So um, I think, you know, making sure that you've got the family support that you might need to help out with kids if you have kids. Um, consider the fact that you may not be able to work those full-time hours while you're in school. You might have to cut back to some part-time, you know, depending. Students usually don't make work adjustments until they get into the program and they're kind of going along and they kind of see how their studies are going. If they're feeling like their, their academics might be suffering and they need more study time, they'll start cutting back at work. Um, so, you know, that for me, that's kind of some of the ways to prepare to be successful. Rapinder, you have anything to add to that? Um, basically use your resources. Don't be afraid to ask. Um, you know, the faculty is here to help. Um, so it is important that you use the resources that are available. Ask for help before you think you need it. You know, trying to catch up afterwards is really difficult. And especially if you're in that clinical setting and things like that, please don't be afraid to ask because that's the biggest thing is use the resources, use, um, you know, the services available to you on and off campus. Um, that's going to be essential. The other thing is, you know, prep ahead of time. You know, um, the more you prep ahead of time, the better it's going to be. How you study for a regular class compared to a clinical is going to be different. It's going to be a whole different set of standpoint. So how you study for anatomy is going to be technically different on how you're going to study for when you're in clinical placement and theory. It's not going to be the same. It's going to be a different um, standpoint. So you're going to have to, uh, you know, come up with different study techniques and study skills. Um, it might not be, you know, memorization anymore. It's going to be practical studying. So that's why that work experience is very essential. Um, we've, you know, I've seen the ones that have had that work experience, that practical experience has definitely helped them with that learning curve when they're in the clinical setting. Um, so whatever you can do on that is going to be definitely uh, beneficial. Um, and, you know, quality over quantity, slow it down if you have to. I mean, especially prepping before you apply to the program, you know, looking at that bigger picture, um, you know, if you need to slow it down, slow it down. Like, you know, I have students who want to double up on all their sciences before they, you know, because they're in this rush to apply. But if you double up and you get those bad grades, you know, okay grades, and I'm going to say, okay, you know, C's and B's, you know, yeah, C's will get you a degree, but they might not get you into a competitive program. And the part is, is that we have a lot of applicants for less spots. So it's better to just do quality over quantity, slow it down if you need to. And there are other options. We've had students go from CNA to LVN, LVN to RN, RN to DSN, and then of course nurse practitioner and so forth. 
So there are steps that can happen. Um, it's just use your resources. That's very true. And I like what you said about, you know, coming to the faculty where, you know, because we are a smaller program. Students are not a number to us. We know yeah. everybody and mm -hmm. um, they do. They come to us early on. We, we do everything we can to support the student success. That's really important to us. We're a team. You know, yeah. that's how we look at it. Yeah, definitely. And we can't help you if we don't know what's going on. So if right. we know what's going on, we'll definitely be able to try to help and use the resources, but we can't read your mind. So, you know, if you ask for help, we'll try our best to do what we can. Yeah, life continues when you're in nursing school. It doesn't like take a break and say, okay, well, we're gonna be nice <laughs> to you because you're in, it doesn't happen. I've had students get cancer and have to go through chemotherapy treatment. I've had students lose loved ones, have major losses. Uh, pregnancies, deliver during the program, divorces, marriages, everything. Life continues on while you're in the program. And, um, you know, that we're here to just help get through that because it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Things are going to just continue to move forward. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, so we did have one question come in the chat. If a student applies for a non-LVN spot in the program, what is a competitive GPA and what experience will get students points? For instance, like a CNA, for instance. Okay, so the point system is 100 points possible. Um, basically, uh, we have a 50%, like I mentioned before, so 35 just in the grades of anatomy, phys, and micro. Ideally, shoot for basically two A's, two B's if you can, because that'll give you about a 3.5. Um, and out of what it is, is you take your prereq GPA divided by four times 0.35 times 100 would equal the points out of that. So if you were a 4.0, you would have 35 out of 35. If you were a 3.5, you could get about 31 or so points. If you 2.5, which is the minimum to apply, you're only going to get 21 points out of 35. So ideally, if you can get your GPA where the prereq GPA is about a 3.5, cumulative at least above a 3.0, you're looking at that, you know, that would be great. Then in terms of uh, you get 10% for having a degree, license, or certificate. So if you have an associate degree before you apply, you'll get 10 out of 10. So ideally, you would want to have your associate degree prior to applying. But if, let's say, you don't have your associate degree, but you're a CNA, you would get six for a CNA certification. If you're an LVN, you would get eight. Um, then you have up to eight points for work experience. So if you have a situation where, you know, you are working as a CNA in skilled nursing, you'll get six. In acute care, you'll get eight. Clinic outpatient, you'll get three. Volunteer, only one. So that's why that work experience sometimes is the make it or break it, especially if I have a student in that, you know, doesn't have. Because if you think about the point system, since it is 100 points, 50%, of course, if you're a 4.0, you're going to get 50 out of 50, right? So if you have that. But then if you have your degree, then you're at 10 points. Now you're at 60 out of 100. Now, if you have, you know, no repeats, we give you 15 points for not repeating. So that's the big thing. I'd rather have a student get a B than, oh, okay, I repeated anatomy and now I got a minus five because I want the 15 out of 15 for no repeats. Um, mm -hmm. You get 10 points for having all your general education requirements. So if you're not missing chemistry, you're going to get 10, you know, and you have your speech and your psych and social get 10 out of 10. Um, then you have up to five points for special circumstances. And out of those five, I mean, one is almost a guarantee in terms of um, your personal challenges and, um, you know, difficult situations because no one's perfect. We all go through something. Right. And that's, that's, that's a good point because sometimes students turn in applications and don't address that. There's mm -hmm. everybody has something that they've had to overcome, a challenge, some circumstance that they've had barrier they've had to overcome and you know we don't judge what that barrier is because you know but everybody's had something that is a point and the need to work is also usually mm -hmm. um a point that you can get yep yeah need to work and then also basically first generation college student if that mom and dad did not have a bachelor's degree um financial aid low income so there's points there and a lot of students even that one point makes a huge difference um two points for bilingual. So if you're close to being bilingual, maybe working on that, building up the strengths, um, then there's, of course, um, you know, so those are some of the things that you can look at to be competitive. Now, the points do range. In the past, we've had like, uh, you know, over 400 applications, and we've had situations where our number 30 was 85, our number 30 was 87. We just don't know. 
Um, you know, it just depends on who you're competing with. And it is getting harder and harder just because of the fact that we are more of a merit kind of a point based system. And we're not a lottery based system. So that's where, you know, trying to look at the point system first, see where you can be advantage. And like, um, what was mentioned before, we have situations where students might not have enough competitive points for us, but we're competitive for COS because there were tests, a great test takers, you know, uh, COS gives you huge points for T's, um, you know, and so forth. So mm -hmm. it all depends on that bigger picture. And the more you apply to, the more options you have. But the biggest thing is when you're taking those prereqs, take them seriously, take them one at a time, do not try to, you know, double up and get the best grades possible in those four um, because of the fact that they are heavily ranked. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, and I think, you know, you mentioned the associate degree. It's helpful really to have that done when you enter the program, then you're only taking the core nursing courses. You're not trying to fit in all this general ed to round out your degree. I would have to say probably the majority, there's maybe just a few that might have a straggling class here or there to finish for their associate degree, but almost every student has that done before they come in. Yeah, majority there's no way, there's no way they could fit in additional units. Mm -hmm. No, I'm and it's, not. Huh. I, I agree. And it's been a struggle for the ones that have had to finish off or leave. Like, for example, I've had situations where, you know, someone from C, uh, didn't have chemistry and they ended up, but they still had an associate degree. So that offset the minus five in the general ed. Um, but then trying, you know, you're encouraging them to do that in the summer or prior to starting, because when you have that and trying to finish up, uh, uh, you know, a general class and in addition to your nursing classes, it's pretty tough. So, and a majority of the students who are applying, I'll be honest, are have coming in with degrees, coming in with work experience and coming in with that aspect. So to be competitive, I mean, you know, yeah, you can apply with just the minimum four, but do we see that? No, we don't see that. Sounds good, thank you. So we did have a few other questions come in the chat. So uh, the first one is, do you have some resources for studying and preparing for the T's exam and would you actually mind explaining what the TEAS exam is for people like me who are not familiar with it? Yes. The TEAS exam is a um, standardized test um, that came out from the state chancellor's office um, that community college programs use to, uh, you know, kind of get a, a baseline of, of student preparation. It's very basic. Um, information from math and science and reading and, and grammar, I wanna say something to that effect. I, I'm really glad it wasn't around when I had to get into a nursing program, I probably would have never passed it. So I'm just really glad I didn't have to take it. Um, the benchmark for that test is a 62%. That is what the benchmark is. That's the goal that you wanna meet. Uh, programs such as COS will give you points for higher T scores. The reason I don't give any points for T's is not included in our, in our criteria mm -hmm. at all. We just ask for the minimum 62% with, I think I even give three attempts. Most schools only give two, mm -hmm. but I give three attempts because I've had students in the program with three attempts on T's and they've done just fine. So the thing with the, the T's is that if, we, if you're really shooting to have students above a 62% in your program, you're, you're really starting to weed out a significant amount of students and disproportionately impacting certain ethnicities and certain students um, that would have done just fine in the program. So just even going up by like a 64% is going to skew that to the degree that it's just going to really eliminate possibilities for so many students. I have never seen a student with a 62 T's do any worse than a student with a 75 T's. That's just in my program. Some directors would argue that and say, oh no, but I, the only time I have seen it be a problem is students that were let in in a program that we did once uh, through a grant before I came that were let in under that 62, those students had trouble. They struggled or they didn't pass their NCLEX, but they had some difficulties. So for me, you know, following all that data and listening to the research that ATI does on T's, I'm very confident with that 62%. Um, I won't bring anybody in underneath it because I've not had good experiences with that. 
but I don't see any difference between those students that score the 62 mm -hmm. versus the 75. Mm -hmm. um, so, but preparing for that, that test is important. This is not an exam you just wanna go take and, and see how it is, right? Because I think students do that sometimes. I'll just go take it, see what it's like, how I do, and then I'll, then I'll worry about studying for it. The problem with that is most programs only give you two attempts. So you can only take it twice. Um, I know Fresno City and COS both have like time frames between attempts that you have to wait. So that also kind of is complicated and they're different time frames. So if you're gonna apply to us, COS and city, you've got to take all those things into consideration <laughs> when you take that tease. So if you go on to the ATI website, they have prep materials, they have you know, programs you can purchase. Um, our office also has some information that we hand out to students on preparing for the TEAS. Um, so, you know, I think COS offers some TEAS prep courses that you can take, um, but, the, but the goal is to go into that test prepared like you would anything else, and then knowing you have a second opportunity to take the test. And if you can, then you, then you take it and get a higher score because that makes you competitive in other programs. Um, so that's, that's where the tease is. And, and yes, you want to prepare for it. Just don't go take it willy nilly. Sounds yeah. good. Thank you. Um, another question came in the chat. Will you have to reapply every time if you're not chosen? Yes. Yep. The criteria will probably change after this year. I don't know. We always look at it. I do a disproportionate impact report to see how it's impacting certain students. Um, so we may do some revisions. There's been some things we've wanted to do um, to it, um, but it's kind of, but you got to do it a year in advance and you got to be on it. And then COVID came in and we were just kind of hanging by our fingernails. Um, so, but yes, because of that, you want to apply every year and your circumstances change. Your your application is going to be stronger each year. You're probably going to add something to it or something might have changed to make you more competitive with the process. And the application pool might change too. So yes. sometimes depending right. on who you're competing yes. with, and of course you're able to see what you can improve. And that's why um, that going forward and look, you know, looking forward and going backwards is important. So looking through the point system, seeing, okay, well, I don't have my degree, so maybe I should finish up and get my associate degree. Um, I don't have the work experience, maybe I should start working. Or if I work more of in a clinical setting, but I could be able to get into acute care and get more additional points that could be a way to do that. Um, so those are things that you definitely want to research and look at. Thank you. Another question, um, online anatomy slash physio classes, et cetera, during COVID will count as prereqs, right? Yes, currently, especially with our program, yes, we will accept them, especially if they're offered with us. However, in the past, um, some programs like for example, Fresno State and other nursing programs will not accept online labs. So it is important that you research those programs and those schools to make sure, um, especially since there are some uh, for-profit schools that offer you know, classes and a lot of people are willing to pay thinking, hey, this class might be easier, it can guarantee my easy A, but then what if the school that you're applying to does not accept it? So mm -hmm. if you are looking at taking um, the prereqs at some for-profit institutions, um, you definitely want to make sure that they're approved first if they're regionally accredited. Um, you know, I have students that will contact me and just double uh, make sure, hey, you know, this University of Phoenix class, will it count, will it not? So I have to check with our faculty to make sure it is equivalent, um, that it is the same course. But current classes that we're offering that have been switched to online due to COVID, yes, we will accept it. Um, not sure if this question will, might be asked, but credit, no credit. I know that that's a question I've gotten. Um, with the situation right now, if, if a student did take a pre prereq class as a credit, no credit, a credit will be considered a C in terms of the point system. So you technically do not want to do a class as a credit, no credit, um, because you want the letter grade to get the most EPA. Sounds good, thank you. And then another question is, um, I don't know if this has been asked already um, or stated previously in previous conversations about the nursing program with us, but does it continue throughout the summer or is it just um, fall and spring program for students? We do fall and spring. We do fall, spring, fall, spring. We do take the summer off. Um, most students are thrilled to have the summer off. 
it's a time to get go back to work, get some extra money, reconnect with your family, get some downtime, recharge, because you come back in the spring or the, the, the fall for your final year, it's pretty heavy. You know, that final year is pretty, pretty hard. So it's, it's good to kind of come back refreshed and ready to go. I mean, it's amazing how fast it goes. You know, every, every year I'm just like, I can't believe you're graduating. It seems like you just got in, you know, and they're like, I know, I can't believe. And then, they, you know, nobody wants to leave. It was so awful, but no one wants to leave. It was so hard and painful. But um, yeah, we don't do the summer. In the summer, we usually run the LVN to RN bridge course. Traditionally, we do that in the summertime. And then those students will enter into the fall semester with the seniors and just have fall and spring semester and then they graduate in event. It's a much shorter um, program. And then and in I the summer you can take concurrent enrollment courses too with that for your school if you're in that program. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you. Rupinder, were you wanting to say anything there? Uh, that, I was going to add that part that Ms. Stephanie just added <laughs> about the <laughs> concurrent enrollment. So a lot of times students will uh, do a program like that, or if it's not that, maybe another class, if they're eventually going to go RN to BSN at another school, research the classes that they need, and they might take additional summer college classes to help with that transition. I will, I will say that the bachelor's in nursing is, should be the entry level to practice. That's, that's, our personal opinion, because, you know, you do have people's lives in your hands. So you should have at least a bachelor's degree to be able to um, do that work well. And there are studies that show that bachelor's prepared nurses in the long run are, you know, more equipped, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but there are so many pathways to that BSN now, you know, it used to be you had to go to a four year school period. That's it. You had that choice and you had the community college. Those were the only options. You have now R into BSN alone programs. Um, you have R into BSN online. You have, so you can graduate and then start an R into BSN program and peck away at that for maybe about a year and be done and get your bachelor's degree. Um, you can go to the four year university and get that. That's just really expensive. You know, our program is $6,000 for two years. You do the concurrent enrollment, you're spending 11,000. So it's just kind of like, I don't know, you know, you don't, you don't need to invest uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars into this education. It's just, it's not necessary. So, um, you know, there's just many opportunities. So you just want to make sure that when you get in and, and it's in a community college or whatever, that you do have a plan in your mind of how you want to go towards that bachelor's degree. You do want to get it because at some point in our profession, they're not going to hire anybody unless you have a bachelor's degree. I, I strongly believe that. That's one of the reasons why we've done this curriculum revision. We've reduced the units so much that students will eventually be able to take our courses at the same time that they're enrolled in a four-year school because you know they can round out the units to full-time and then they can just graduate. I recently just hired a graduate from our program to teach our um, pediatric clinical down at CRMC this coming March. She was a graduate of our program and uh, she did this. She was one of the very first concurrent, she was the first concurrent enrollment student in this program that we did and graduated with her bachelor's degree less than a year after graduating from us. And now she's in her master's program nearly finished and she's now coming back to teach for us. You know, those are the things I like to do. I just like to rope people back in. It's just a circle loop. I'll just drag you back in <laughs> and teach for us in the long run. But I think that's a success story to me, you know. So she's, you know, she was very um, good about how she planned that out and didn't waste a lot of time trying to now reapply to an RN to BSN program or something like that. You know, once you concurrently enroll, you're already in. You don't have to do now that other step, right? You're already invested. It really just makes it so much simpler. And there's a lot of options, like Catherine was saying, uh, Ms. Stephanie was saying, there's a lot of options for RN to BSN. A lot of public schools, well, CSUs, there are some that do yes, the RN yes. to BSN online. Yep, so sure. you don't have to um, on there. So it's doing that research is really important ahead of time. And if you're doing certain levels, like if you are considering uh, an LVN program, maybe looking at the adult schools for the LVN programs or the community colleges that offer them, um, over, you know, the private schools or for-profit schools, 
So it's really important to research all the approved nursing programs. And like I mentioned, the Board of Nursing website is a great tool because you can see the pass rates. You can see if it's going to be worth your investment. You know, some people, you know, if you really want to do a certain level, look at that and see, um, especially if you're looking forward, there are some that already know that their goal is to be a nurse practitioner or to be a midwife or to be a nurse anesthesia. Look at that requirements ahead of time, knowing that, okay, this is where I need to go eventually. Like if I want to do a certain thing, I need to maybe work in the ICU for a good year before mm -hmm. I can apply. So learning that stuff ahead of time is going to be really uh, um, essential. So preparing is a big thing. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, a few questions have come in the chat. Is the LVN RN bridge program three semesters? Pretty much one summer bridge and then two full semesters. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you. And then um, a student just wanted to clarify, but when retaking a class and getting an A will be higher GPA, will that look better or does getting less points make us less competitive for retaking a class? That might be worded a little weird, but does that make sense, that question? So yes. it does okay. make sense. And what it is, is that it depends. Like uh, I've had situations where a student got a C and they wanted to repeat because they got a C. And so technically if you get a D or an F, you do have to repeat because a D or an F is not sufficient. So then you're, if you got a D and you repeat, you get a minus five. I tell students ahead of time, if they're close to that point where they could withdraw, get the W before you get the bad grade. So one W in our point system does not require, and does not give you a minus five. So if you're in a situation where you know you're, you're gonna not pass the class with a, basically a, a passing grade, try to get the W if you can, because that'll be one W is not gonna be a minus five. Two Ws would be a minus five. Now let's say you got a C and you got a C in you know, anatomy, and you haven't taken physiology, micro, or, and so forth, what I would do is I wouldn't repeat anatomy first. I would see how you're doing in the other classes, get the A in the other courses to see if that's enough. Because if you go from, yes, I repeated anatomy, but I'm gonna get a minus five. Well, remember a C is a 2.0 and A is a 4.0. So what did you go up? Two points. But remember, you also getting a minus five for repeating. So you actually will go down in points by repeating. So the main thing is don't try to repeat in the first place. So balance your schedule, do well, use your resources, use the tutoring. We have all these websites, you know, you have Khan Academy, you have your office hours for your instructors. Don't rush it. Don't double if you don't want to double, you know, don't double the sciences. I have students that will take the cohorts or take, you know, the first nine weeks of anatomy, take the second nine weeks of physiology and don't realize how much time you have to put into it. So really just try to avoid the repeat, but if you have to repeat, looking at that bigger picture um, and saying, okay, how does that work? Um, I had a few students who I you know, told them don't repeat because when we looked at the point system, you can calculate your own points. It's not, you know, you can literally see, okay, what's that gonna be like? And it's not, sometimes it's not beneficial. Now, if you did get a D or an F, you have to, but if you got a C, you might not want to because the overall might lower your points. So what you do is have to look at, okay, well, that means I got to get an A in the next class or I got to see where I'm going from there. Does that make sense? This repeat situation came from students in the past getting Bs and repeating and repeating until they got an A. And so programs started looking at that and going, okay, this is kind of not beneficial. You know, we're going to take the first grade and then we're going to penalize you if you continue to take and take and take just to get that A, you know, it's that kind of a thing. Another student wanted to know the next application period dates for this program, and I also think it would be great to um, share with the students where they can get that information on their own for future application dates. Mm -hmm. On our website usually is where everything is posted for the application dates. We traditionally have one application period once a year from January to February. This year we did a, usually it's from, we open up in January, I forget how we used to do it, but anyway. It used to had, be November. Oh, that's it. We used to open up in November and go all the way through like February 1st. So we did a really long, you know, this is, you know, and this last time we only did one month because it was online. It was open for, you know, information and prep your materials and all of that. But then you had it open for one month to go in and go ahead and insert all of your paperwork. Um, and it, seem to, I mean, it wasn't the greatest, you know, I mean, I know we have bugs in it and there's problems and we're going to fix it. Um, but, you know, for the most part, it, it worked, you know, we got, 
got 500 applications sitting in there. So obviously people navigated it okay. Well, it's because in the fall semester, most students are in progress in their last prereq mm -hmm. microbiology. So they're usually waiting until after December to right. do the application in January. So that's usually the process that they'll do um, in terms of that. So usually you wanna get your stuff ready and kind of go through, um, but it is once a year and it is based on the point system. Um, thank you so much. We have a few questions that have come in and I wanna make sure that we address them before the end of the event today. Um, who are the universities, if we have any, that we have bachelor agreements with? University of Phoenix and Grand Canyon University, those two, and they are private schools. I have tried to get agreements with any of the CSUs. I've not been successful with that. Um, for a variety of reasons. You know, it's just kind of difficult sometimes to get two state schools together to coordinate things. Um, but I will tell you that why I like both of those schools is that they've been very accommodating to the student schedules. If things change like with COVID and then they've worked with us and said, hey, these things have happened, we wanna move some classes around so it's not so stressful for the students. But the tuition that they offer you while you're in the program cannot be beat. It's cheaper than a CSU, it's just, and then they have a variety of ways that you can pay. You can pay as you go, you can you know, um, use financial aid, you can, I mean, there's a variety of ways that they've worked it out where students can, um, you know, pay for this, uh, these courses. So um, I'm just not getting that kind of cooperation from some of the other schools, you know. Uh, there are some schools, uh, you know, down south, uh, Riverside, which is a very large uh, nursing community college that has done some significant work with um, their local CSUs with various, like several pathways. Students can apply to this school, to that school, to that school. It's all integrated within the program. So that's the model that we're kind of watching. Um, and, uh, but they've had good success. We just haven't had that here in the Central Valley. Okay, we have another question from a student. Um, I was majoring in psychology and I just changed my major to health science. I will be taking philosophy three in spring 2022 but anatomy isn't on my education plan. I recall you saying that we have to take anatomy first and then philosophy or, philosophy or um, three. <laughs> okay, um, and this, this left the student confused. So could you please clarify a little bit? Okay, so the prereqs again are human anatomy, human physiology, microbiology, and of course, English. Ethics is one of the general ed prereqs, um, technically for Fresno State in terms of transferring, and that's philosophy three. Philosophy and physiology are, of course, two different courses. Now, if physiology, which is bio 35, is not on the student's, um, you know, uh, ed plan, then probably needs to come back to me and we'll fix it. <laughs> so, so we'll make sure that it's on the educational plan. Um, but technically, uh, the main ones, like I said, is human anatomy, human physiology, microbiology. So bio 32, bio 35, and bio 38. Before you can take bio 38, you would need chemistry 2A. Now, some nursing pro BSN programs do want chem 1A, which is inter uh, general chemistry. Um, so like Channel Islands, CSU Channel Islands does want in um, general chemistry over chemistry 2A. So it just depends again on where they're applying to. Um, Fresno State will take the 2A. Um, but philosophy three is ethics and ethics is a recommended course that Fresno State does want for their uh, BSN program. Um, but if it, anatomy is not on the ed plan for the student, please um, contact me and we can get it fixed. And um, another student um, was asking about um, the point system for the program. And um, I'm not gonna ask their questions because we have kind of gone over that point system already. So if you still have questions on being eligible or what your point value might be, I would encourage you to contact Rupinder um, and she can go over that with you. Earlier in the chat, I shared the website for the program and her contact information is on that page. So please just go to that link in the chat and, um, and you can get her contact information from there. Mm -hmm. uh, the last question that we probably have time for today is how soon do we find out if we are accepted into the program? Yeah, we're going to start reviewing applications here shortly. So um, we say roughly eight to 10 weeks after the application period closes. Our goal is to have it have it all kind of 
sewn up before spring break. I don't know if that'll happen this year. So, um, but you know, eight to 10 weeks post, um, post uh, ending of the period. Sounds good, thank you. So that is all the time we have for questions today. I am going to be putting in the chat a survey link for you guys um, that just kind of asks a few questions. I think there's five questions on what you thought of the event today. We wanna to make sure that the events we do, whether they're online or in person, when we open up campus, whenever that is, um, that they're useful, beneficial, and that you guys as students find the information um, to be really helpful in your education and in your career goals. So the survey link is now in the chat. Please, when you have time, go and answer those questions for us so we can make sure that we continue doing helpful events for you. And then I also wanted to add the health careers contact information um, if you want to get in touch with their office. So there's their phone number and also the email for you in the chat. And I'm also going to be posting that website again for the nursing program. And that has Repinder's contact information on there along with helpful information. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Repinder and Kathy, for uh, speaking with us today. It was wonderful information. I think Thanks. everyone really learned a lot from everything you shared. Thank you all for joining us. So when you meet with Repinder, listen to what she says and do what she says. <laughs> That's all <laughs> I can say. She knows what she's talking about. Yes. Thank Sounds you. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys. We'll all right. See you Thank guys you. Later. Have Bye. a good one. Stay safe, everyone.